Hello to all Mavericks out there. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. Here at Hospitality Mavericks, we are on a mission to inspire entrepreneurs and leaders in the hospitality industry to create a heart-centered and profitable business from the inside out. The kind that both employees and customers love and support. Today, we are lucky to talk with Andreas Carlson, the CEO of Sticks and Susie. Before Sticks and Susie, he worked with Wakamama for 15 years, both in the UK and internationally. Andreas has been with Sticks and Tuesday for over seven years and have played an important role in the expansion of the Danish concept in London and recently Berlin and many other cities. We reached out to Andreas to hear about Sticks and Tuesday and to get his take on the industry, leadership and employee and customer experience, as well as Tech's role in running a hospitality business. Hello Andreas and welcome to Hospitality Maverick podcast and thank you very much for inviting us to your restaurant here, Sticks and Susie restaurant here in Victoria, Nova. Really happy to be here and to have a conversation with you about, you know, Sticks and Susie, your your journey, but also what's going on in the industry right now. Yeah, thank you. Welcome and thanks for inviting me. As always, it's always interesting starting out with the people on the podcast, hearing a bit about where they're coming from, how does a, did a Swedish Viking like you end up in London and in hospitality and now with the Danish concept Sticks and Susie? Well, my, my dream as a, young, as a young boy from the north of Sweden where I'm from, um, always had the dream about uh, working abroad. That, that was what I had in mind from, a, from the year of when I was 14, 15 years old. My first step into the, to the real world was to move from, from my hometown down to Stockholm where I lived for about three and a half years and and I always had this dream in my mind that I was going to work abroad and uh, funny enough uh, it was a colleague of mine who said they were looking for for restaurant staff in uh, in London and I spoke to my boss and she said great idea I give you three months off so you can go and test it out if you get the job I got the job but I never returned and that is uh, 24 years ago so over half my life I've been living here in in the UK now so so that's the the, the short answer to, to the question, but uh, that desire of, of working outside of the border of Sweden was, was on, on my mind from an early age. And uh, you had a bit of a journey in hospitality. You've not only been with Sticks and Tussi before that, you were with another well-known uh, brand here in the industry. Yeah, that's correct. My, my first job when I came to London was, was a hotel, a uh, hotel restaurant, and, and funny enough, I became a, a very loyal customer of Wagamama at the first restaurant in Streatham Street, Bloomsbury. And uh, I was a big fan. I got, I got hold of the news that they were going to, to open up a second restaurant. So I um, sent my CV and I was lucky enough to have an interview with uh, Alan Yao and his sister Tina about taking a, a role in that new restaurant in, in Soho. So back in 1995, I joined uh, the opening of the second restaurant for, for Wagamama and I stayed very loyal to them for over 15 years, almost 16 years. And I must say, I, I went on the, the best journey and went to the best school in hospitality uh, that I could ever uh, imagine. So um, that was, that was an, an amazing, amazing time. So where did you start at hospitality? Were you in the kitchen or were you the service team? Uh, how, how was your start? Most, most people start, you know, either with uh, cleaning the loos and then they work themselves up either to the kitchen or to the service team. Again, I need to go back to my, to my teenage age years uh, where, where I got in contact with hospitality, um, working for uh, a, uh, an Italian guy who owned a little uh, Italian restaurant in my hometown. Um, and again, um, I was there for, for a work experience for a week. I did quite well. He asked me to come and wash uh, plates for two and a half hours every lunchtime at my school holiday as a 14-year-old, which I did. And that developed and into to, to learning uh, the basic kitchen skills and, and, and making the pizzas and eventually serving uh, guests as a, as a waiter. And as an 18-year-old, I held the keys to the restaurant and I opened it up on my own on a, on a Saturday morning. So that's how I got the bug uh, in hospitality. and, and uh, uh, I was quite good at it and I kind of stuck to that industry and it's truly an enjoyable industry to be in. Taking the journey from north of Sweden to London, uh, starting in restaurants, then joining probably one of the most successful rollouts of a, a, a casual dining concept you've seen for years, and then uh, moving to Sticks and Sushi, a Danish concept. Where What was it that made you excited to make that uh, transition because I guess at that point that was a much smaller business to join than what you came from. That's correct. 
again, um, the journey with Wagamama was exceptional. Um, I was lucky enough to work uh, within the, the international uh, development for the past kind of eight years. The last eight years I was focused on, on that. So I was traveling a lot, opening uh, restaurants under license with Wagamama around the world. The travel is also tiring and, and have a backside to it. So, so, so eventually that, that novelty wears off. And when you're in this industry, you, you, the unique thing with hospitality is that, that you network and you meet people and you share experiences and, and you help colleagues in the industry. And, and we came in contact, or I came in contact with, uh, with Sticks and Sushi through the industry and, and got to know the, the, the founders of the business. And, and we stayed in contact and uh, they, they were knocking on my door a few times uh, about the, their dream and vision about opening Sticks and Sushi in London. And, uh, uh, eventually, the, one of the founders and the CEO, Kim, grinded me down and, and I, I agreed to, to, to jump ship. Again, uh, really going back to the roots where you're even closer to the, the, to the guest, to the consumer of your product was, was attractive and, again. And I was a big fan of Sticks and Sushi myself as, as I was visiting Copenhagen frequently. So I could see that the, the, the product would, would stand up in the market of London. and. Uh, that's why I said I take a calculated risk now uh, of, uh, of jumping ship. And uh, as Kim put it to me, I can promise you one thing uh, amongst others, but one of the, the things I can promise you is that we're going to have a, lots of fun together. And, and uh, it's no doubt that this industry is lots of fun and, and our journey so far has been mostly enjoyable. Yeah, coming back to Sticks and Sushi now, roll out in London. Uh, you have a number of locations. You are in Oxford, Cambridge, and you have two more on the go. And also you've gone to Berlin, as I know. What, what, is, the, what is the next step for Sticks and Sushi? Is, is there anything you know outside London that's worth pursuing? Or are we talking about other countries besides Germany and so on? Or is it a, a capital concept? Uh, well, first of all, I correct you there, Michael. Uh, we don't like the word rollout. We're opening one restaurant at a time. We focus very much on, on doing each and every restaurant uh, as good as we can. If you take it uh, and take that approach to, to your growth, whichever pace you choose to go your growth, I think you have a greater success of having a really solid and sustainable business. So uh, for us, we, we, we had a, a strategy about the UK market and, and where we would consider going and so on. And, and we have concentrated on London and the Southeast. Uh, we have more opportunities to go uh, further north and to, to other cities around, around the UK. But I think for now, as the market looks like now with, with what's around the corner with changes in, in, in the way of Britain is uh, UK is, is connected to the EU or not we, we will stick to, to where we are we stick to London we are very much a city concept and, and having a cluster approach is, is, is a good way for us to control uh, what we do quality service and, and the engagement with the, all of the team members that we have so so that's that's where we are with with the UK and London certainly could hold a few more restaurants and we have two more on the go we're opening Kings Road here in September and with some luck uh, we will open up the second one this year in in Soho in Beak Street by the end of this year early next so uh, so that that's the plan and then in terms of our, our, our approach to where else to go we will certainly continue the plan and the journey in Germany with with more restaurants there so um, we, we try to, to do it well and do it one at a time, but it's certainly a, a city concept more than anything else. And it, as it's fairly complex when it comes to execution and the skill set of, of uh, what we do, especially back of house, uh, needs to be top notch. And, and staffing is always more uh, challenging when you go out to the smaller towns uh, and cities outside of, of, of the hubs of, of main cities like Copenhagen and London and Berlin. So what is the secret ingredients now? You're saying you're opening one restaurant at a time. You're taking a, you know, a, a standard operator's approach to get that restaurant working really well. What is your, your secret to the success you have? Because you're perceived as a trade chain, but I've been in numbers of your location. They all feel different. That's definitely something with the layout that is different and the experience. But what is the secret, internal secret? I, I guess, I guess if, you, if you truly make your your leaders who is responsible for each location as the ambassadors of that location and and you give them the ownership of that specific restaurant 
that pays off in the long run because they will certainly nurture the team that works for them, but it will also nurture the, the regular guests that you have. And if you, if you have that formula right, you have a greater success of, of, of succeeding. And, and one of the things that you also need to have is to have patience. And in this industry, not every restaurant you open starts with a with a big bang and, 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 and the guests are, are flogging in and start queuing outside your door, that's not the case. So when you have a slower start, you need to have the patience uh, to actually invest in achieving the quality that you're known for and not trying to cut corners for the short-term gain. So uh, that also means that, that the owners needs to have the, the money to, to invest in that execution when the start is not as good as you, you hoped for. So I think, I think that is, that is a, a, a good way of, of explaining how, how you can uh, make it a success. So uh, focus more on, on, on the restaurant and the leaders there than focusing on your overhead uh, and the people around you who is, who is actually not contributing to the guest experience. You talked about giving the leader almost autonomy to, to, to run the business and you talked about patience as well. I guess that's also a journey when you get you know, managers because you cannot always foster everything from internally, I guess. You also sometimes have to get people from the outside and learn them the sticks and sushi culture. Can you give a bit of you know, your thinking and approach to how you, how you deal with that? You always want to reward people who's been loyal to you and worked for you and you grow them within your business into to leaders or if it's in the kitchen or, or on, on the restaurant floor. You, you want to have that natural flow of, of talent coming through. But as you said, it's very important that you also uh, invite new talent and people with the same values to join your business. And when you have external leaders coming on board, um, again, patience is, is, is important. What I mean with that is that you need to give them the time not to learn how to carry a tray of, of, of food or, or to, to prep whatever you prep in the kitchen. Uh, it's about giving them the time to settle into the culture and, and the values of the business. So that hiring early of leaders when, when you need the leader is, is, is crucial. So again, it's going to cost you physical more salary to get them to where you are or you're investing that salary in ensuring and safeguarding that when they when you give them the 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 responsibility they they will they will take it and they will execute it in in the best possible way so don't don't rush that i think then you are watering out the quality that you you stand for do you have like a, a specific roadmap on how you're doing this when you get them on the journey early is there specific things you take them through to you know understand and lift the culture and also have the skills they need to have to to run you know a, a restaurant on their own when they are set loose yeah, well, well, first of all, as I said before, it's, it's, we give them the time to, to strip off all of the, the, the responsibilities that they will have later on and they, they, they have time to learn from, from the bottom up because if they really have the, the, the knowledge of how we go about things, they can also later on actually train from bottom up when they come on board. So, so the, 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 the crucial thing here is, is that they are, they are trained all way through and and by doing that you you give them you give them more power later on because they know how things are done uh, and that helps a great great deal talking about you know opening restaurants getting the management right um, I've been visiting and being a happy customer and I love your, your product and uh, I can remember from my first time I tried your product in Nansen scale in Copenhagen and to, to try it in London as well what what is the there's a secret behind because I know I, I expect it's something with your culture to do because replicating culture and we talked about it on other occasions it's one of the most difficult things in hospitality and it's the secret glue how, how is sticks and sushi approaching this how is the, is the people factor the human factor how, how are you how are you doing that as you, you open more and more restaurants well the, the the greater and the bigger you grow a business the harder it is to protect it there is no doubt about it but the unique thing with 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 sticks and sushi is that when you have the founding family members still active in the business after 24 years soon 25 years that that, that contributes a huge amount towards this and they have always always focused on, on holding on to the family values the way they have created this business and you need to salute that and you need to protect that and and that is what we are we are focusing on every day but as you grow and, and, and you have not only 100 
staff members, you have over a thousand people working in, in a group. You don't know everyone, but you need to have the, the, the mini ambassador so the message cascades down throughout the, the, the organization. So uh, it's not a walk in the park and, and, and it's like it's like restaurant operation. You need to be focusing on it every single day. And, and there is no difference here in terms of maintaining the, the, the values uh, and the culture that you have in a business. I guess also if you're focusing on getting a restaurant to work really well, that helps you on that journey because if the operation works, is my experience, and people have a good experience coming to work, I like to come to work, things are working, my managers are talking to me respectfully, that makes that journey easier, I guess. Yeah, we, we, we like to talk to each other, not about each other, um, and, and, and when you start talking about each other, that most of the time creates gossip, and gossip is not is not good in any organization that's cancer for any organization so by by uh, communicating well and 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 be firm and direct and fair uh, i think you win that you, you win in the long time by by conducting your 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 work like that and and there is there is there is no secret recipe more than that you just need to keep reminding yourself that this is a, a very very important part of of what you do on a daily basis we talked about making the transformation on, on a cultural level. What about uh, you know the, the food and, and, and the experience in itself? Have you had to tweak the things to make it work in the UK and the London market as you you've grown here, or have you actually taken the Danish model and done the same here? If you doubt that your your product and your model needs adjusting and tweaking and changing before you go internationally, then you should reconsider to go internationally. You need to be dead certain that what you have is good enough. If what you have is not good enough, stay at home, quite frankly. So when we opened uh, our first restaurant in Wimbledon here in, in 2012, we, we didn't change the formula at all. We, we focused on executing sticks and sushi as, as, as good as we possibly could and listen very loud to our guests and, and hearing what they what they were saying and in the beginning they have no reference to anything else because no one did what we were doing uh, so it was a lots of lots of guests who who compared us to to other operators and and then judged us compared to other operators where we were we were too expensive or we were too cheap or and so on but it didn't take more than a couple of months and and then these comments went away and and they respected us for what we stood for so um, no, don't, we didn't change much. We, 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 we stuck to, to the recipe as we knew. We talked a bit about leadership before. It takes me to, to another a thing you're really good at, or definitely what your present employees and future employees are looking at. They're looking at what they call Glassdoor. And you have a quite amazing reviews compared to, to, to many employers. It's very tough to get as strong reviews as, as you get. What is the, the secret recipe when we come to the, we talked about a little about management and how we deal with that the frontline employees, which are the, we know, the crucial part of hospitality. They are the one creating the experience for the guests. They are the ones to make sure that sales is developing in the right way. What is that you're doing there to, to get that so right? Because they are really raving about how to work there in Sticks and Susie. I, I think it comes back to, to, to quality in what you do in every aspect. If it's, if it's the product you're actually producing and putting on the, on, on the plate in front of your guest, or is the way you communicate with your staff, the engagement you let your staff have with the guest. If you, if you focus on that quality, you will get your team to, to be proud of being associated to your brand. So when you, have, when you can be proud and they truly say, I work there and there, if it's sticks and sushi or someone else, when you have that engagement, then they can be proud of the product. I think that is really the key to to it because you cannot you cannot manufacture and artificially create that connection with your with your staff member unless they have that connection with your product. So so maintaining that quality in everything you do, I, I think that creates the, the the success of how the, the businesses proceed from the outside in. So. Stick to your quality and, and, then, and then your staff can, can, can be proud of what you do. I think, think it's that simple. It's well known that you don't leave a company, you leave your nearest boss or manager. So what do you do then? In the, because I know that's one of the most influential things you do. If you really train your, your managers in being good in the people factor, on the soft values, some people call them, I call them quite hardcore factors to make things work. So what, what is it that uh, you are learning your managers? Do you think that's different? 
than others are doing. I think it's that basic fact that you say good morning and hi, and you said you say goodbye and bye when when you when you leave your workplace. If it's if it's your office or if it's your restaurant, you you, you treat your colleagues in the same way as you 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 greet your guest and say goodbye to your guest. So that there is no difference there. So so leaders, their guests, they are further away from paying guests, but their guest is is the people who who works for them, who executes the, the, the experience for, for the paying guests. So I think, I think it, it's, it's not more difficult than that, that if the, the boss above you and the leader above you behaves and set the tone of the business and the family in Sticks and Sushi have certainly maintained and set that tone, again, that filters through the organization. So um, that's, that's, that's why I, how I see it. So what you're saying is actually reflecting what uh, the, the, the founders are doing is reflecting all the way down in the organization and uh, the, the managers are mirroring themselves in that way of communicating and acting. I hope so. I hope I'm right with that. I, I admire I admire a number of restaurant groups and, and, and I know the, 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 the founders and the people at the top and, and I see a direct link to the behavior and the values a leader and a founder of a business have and how that feels when you are there as a guest so uh, I'm a true believer in that so so a bit of a, a, a curveball here so you uh, what other concept if I get interesting what other concept or leaders of hospitality business could also be leaders outside of that do you think inspire you and your way of doing things in Dixon Susie well I'm a big fan I'm a big fan of Dishoom um, I think it's a great product and and uh, I think the the, the way and the conduct of Kavi, one of the founders, the way he is, the positive nature he has, and the way he looks at his team, uh, reflects the experience you have to when you go and, and visit the Shum. So, so that's that's just one of the examples of a, of a place where where I see a direct connect with the top and and what's going on 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 the restaurant floor. A growing business like like ours and like the Shum, it's harder and harder to hold on to that. So, uh, I would like to pick Kavi's brain more about what he does. Uh, but that, that, that is, that is a, uh, an example of an organization which I, which I uh, highly admire. Great. So coming a bit back to the industry, we are in a, some people call them very challenging time. Other people say interesting time. Somebody talks about the perfect storm, rise of cost, you know, shortage of workforce, Brexit, etc., etc. An economy maybe going a bit, bit slow. How is your view on that? And how, how is Sticks and Sushi navigating in all these uh, different outside things you in principle can't do anything about you're just part of well with brexit i think people will still eat and since the the vote of of leaving people have continued eating out so that's that's a good sign so i don't think everyone will go on a on a severe diet because because of that i think i think i think it's dangerous when you start looking at all the external factors and and start finding reasons with the external factors that that you're not doing as well. You need to look at what you do yourself first and foremost. Yes, the rising costs that you can't do anything about, you need to deal with. Can you pass on the entire cost to the guests and and expect them to pay for for the increase of, let's say, business rates in central London? No, there are certain things businesses also need to absorb and be clever, more clever with dealing with. And, and again, if you focus on your, your own execution and your own uh, way of, of running your business, first and foremost, then we, you can get through tough times. So, so that's my take on it. Concentrate on your, own, on your own game, first and foremost, and don't blame other things for, for the, the go and get stuff. And, and, and be dynamic in the way you're dealing with it. And, and there's a lot uh, talking about now, you've seen some of the big ones uh, in, in trouble and, and so on. Do you think that's a natural development of uh, you know, any growth and in any industry, there'll be a correction that needs to happen? Or what, where do you think that come from? Or is just that's the first sign maybe on the economy sliding a bit? I think the, the, there is one theme running through uh, most groups who who's who come into trouble I, I think i think when you grow too fast um, uh, and you you are it's harder and harder to maintain the quality that you were known for the guests these days they 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 judge you very very quick and they can also share their experience much quicker now than we did 10 years ago i i think i think it, the, the the correction is is already ongoing on on that one but when when you have a measured 
growth and, and you, you consider where you open and you really uh, execute every opening well, I think then you still have a, a, a bright future. So, so I think the correction will be that pace uh, groups have been opening will slow down. I still see that there will continue being a growth within the industry of the ones who's doing it the right way. And it depends on, on the complexity of, of, your, of, your, of your concept. But even the, the more simple concept in terms of execution, they will also consider those things now moving forward into the future. When I meet other people from the industry, there, so one of the things they talk a lot about and what they faced up here to the summer period, which is the busy periods in, in hospitality, one of the busy periods like Christmas is uh, staffing. Is that something you have felt as well, that the number of application, the quality of people is going down, maybe driven a bit by Brexit, but also on other factors in the market? Well, there's certainly a, a slowdown of, of European workers coming in. But, but again, you need to concentrate on your own execution. How good are you as an employer? Let's face it, you just need to be the best employer in the market. Then you have a chance of attracting the best people. If you ignore that, then you get what you deserve. And for us, it's obviously selecting well, training them well, and making them then them ambassadors of, of your of your brand. And, and then they stay longer. And then there is a natural churn of, of staff who is who is moving on to, to other things and, and, and so on. But that's the nature of, of the business. But remember, you got to make sure that everyone who leaves you are still ambassadors for you when they left. So they are still promoting and talking about you. And, and I'm certainly a proud ex Wagamama employee where I can look back and, and, and I, can, I can still feel that connection with that brand when I see them doing well in the industry. So, um, so, so hold on to your, to your staff even when they left you because they are true ambassadors post their employment period with you. That, that's a really good point and that's also what I've, I've often have seen like really strong operators they're good at they will have people that send almost people to them even though they stop working there I think you should go and work for so and so so uh, technology is another thing there's a lot of talk about and we have had a lot of conversation about technology how do you see technology's role in hospitality uh, there's some quite bold statement out there that technology is almost the innovator and sometimes the saver for the coming through the perfect storm we've just been discussing. What is your view on, on technology and how you uh, sticks and sushi should approach it? Well, we were, we were very much first movers in Denmark with online ordering uh, with our old platform. And, and we are investing now in a new digital platform, which will be our own next step. So the, the, the guest journey uh, online will be as good as the guest journey when they come to, to our restaurant. So, so that's what we are doing. In, in terms of other things out there when it, when it comes to, to technology and payment solutions and, and, and experience rating of, of, of the guest who visits you, it's so much coming at you. Uh, and, and for us who, who spends longer period of time with our guests, still we can gauge uh, their, how they find the experience better than when you have a very short period of time with, with, with your guests. Uh, so, so for us, we, we haven't jumped on to everything that's flying around. We take our time and we are investing on our new di digital platform here over the next six months. And, and, and then we will then uh, readjust and see where, where we're sitting. What about the uh, internal tech solution, you know, things to help workforce management, uh, infrastructure things like scheduling systems, recruitment systems, operation system, checklists, uh, inventory and stuff like that. Is that something you're invested heavily into, you know, save time in principle and getting the managers and employees focusing on what's really important, the experience? We, we have we have a new, numerous platforms that that we are working with and and when you worked with some of them and some are more uh, transparent and, and like to integrate with other systems the, the key thing with with when you have multiple platforms for various things is that they can talk to each other so the information is, is seamlessly passed on between the various platforms to avoid any any uh, miss input of data because that will just throw uh, information uh, and and you you can't you can't rely on 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 what the what the data is telling you. So so for us, we have a number. We we will we will certainly after the digital implementation look at improving on those. So so they are integrated better with each other. Uh, so um, 
Let's see, one step at a time. Do you think uh, notoriously the industry is slower than other industries to uh, to use you know, innovation and, and tech and things like that? Or do you just think it's a quite normal thing from you know, the kind of business it is? It has to be a bit slower. No, I think, I think lots have happened here over the past past five years, especially with, with uh, uh, the various ordering platforms for food and the solutions, because, you know, it, it is really from, from, from brick to click in, in our industry as well. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's become any, any slower. The, the interesting thing is it will accelerate even more as our consumer, our guests are getting younger and they living their life more through the, the, the smartphones and, and, and so on. So you need, to be, you need to be on the money there to, to follow what's going on. So, so coming a bit about to the, the industry, the way we, we have operated restaurants is, is almost the same way we've done for generations. Do you think there's going to be a, a shift in the way to how to run restaurants? Would it be a different way? Would it be less independent? Would it be more independent? How is it going to be more change around? How do you see the, the whole uh, scene for, for how we operate and run restaurants? We, we, are, we, are, we are kind of pack animals and we like to, to, to meet and we want to look at people when when uh, when when we enjoy food especially so uh, the traditional restaurants will always be there for sure then the loyalty to where you go and socialize will also be online so you will still be brand loyal when you want to have your your your, your favorite food at home so that's where technology kicks in but but that social aspect will still be there you know the the, the various the various uh, platform if it's if it's uh, the various consumer groups on via Facebook or whatever, but consuming food together is, is still going to be there. And, and even so, when you pick up your, your food for, for your consumption at home, most of the time what we see, the, the, the orders are for multiple guests, uh, unless, unless we have single guests eating a heck of lots of food. I don't think that's the case. But we can see that the social aspect of consuming food is still there as, as two or more when the food is taken from our restaurant to, to the home or the office. Just taking a bit a uh, step away from the industry and, and sticks and sushi and coming back to you. What do you do to, to, you know, to innovate yourself and you know, be part of that journey? So, so many years in hospitality, there must be some reinventing happening inside yourself as, as a leader, you know, your responsible goes up and you know, more complexity to manage. What, what, how do you manage your, yourself and the way you lead the, the business? Well, well, first of all, if, if you're in this business, you spend a lot of time in the business and not in your own business, but you also spend a lot of time in, in other businesses. So you, you, get, you get inspiration and, and you see things what others are doing. And, and that's the natural, the natural involvement for, for myself to, 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 to listen to, to read, to look, to experience, um, and and that's the beauty with with our industry. We we, we have literally have a license to to dine out at other places, and and it's a part of your job. But it's 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 also an amazing hobby. Uh, and I think I think when when you work in hospitality, uh, it is it is part hobby, part work. And and you wouldn't be in this industry un, unless you really really enjoyed it. Uh, so so I guess. That is one thing, and, and I'm lucky enough to, to have maintained a lot of uh, colleagues and friends outside of, of the UK. So it's not only just looking at the UK market, but also keeping in contact with, with, with friends and colleagues from other, from other countries to know what's going on there, because trends are, are coming from all sorts of places, also from, from abroad. So um, it's maintaining that that, that, that keeps me fresh and, and, and trying to, to be top of the curve. Great, great. So before we end here, we always have one question for our guests. If you could give one advice, only one advice to somebody starting out in hospitality, it could be starting your own restaurant or becoming a manager or, or just want to join hospitality in general, what would your top advice be, the one advice that will make a difference for their journey? So in, in terms of starting your own business, one step at a time, make sure that you can create something that, that you you can be proud of from a quality perspective. Do that well and don't, don't think about, about the, the, the size and, and number of units and, and how big you're going to become. Just do one, whatever you do, and do it really, really well. If you do it really, really well, then you have a chance of doing a second one. So, so that's from an entrepreneurial perspective. When it comes to people who want to, to get into the industry, 
uh, you mentioned, mentioned glass doors, but you also got to look at yourself. What is it that makes you tick? What, if you want to get into hospitality, what is it? Is it is it a is it a full service restaurant? Is it is it is it a hotel? Is it front of house? Is it back of house? What is it that makes you tick? And and when you when you then figure that one out, then you can start exploring that segment within hospitality. You you will have a greater chance of making the right choice when you when you get into hospitality by thinking like that. Thank you very much for your time and inviting us to your beautiful restaurant here in Victoria. And uh, hope to have you on the, the podcast again in the, in the near future to hear about how Sticks and Susie and your journey develops. Well, it was a great great talk. Thanks, Michael. My pleasure. So there you have it. We would like to thank Andreas again for his time, industry insights and thoughts on leadership, employee and customer experience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a like, share or even better, tell us what you think. What does your organization do to ensure a unique employee experience? What are your top tips to navigate through the current storm in the hospitality industry? As always, thank you to our producer, Laura Evans from Let's Talk Video Production. We hope you enjoyed today's Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingser. Tune in next time for another industry interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.